are human beings connected to one another in this mysterious and wondrous journey we call life. Events may happen in our lives that fill us with great joy and celebration. Things may happen in our lives that fill us with great sorrow and sadness. Events may happen in our lives that fill us with concern and confusion. We may not always understand our thoughts and our feelings. We may not always understand why any of these things happen in our lives. But we gather on a Sunday as a human family to acknowledge them, to share them, and to remind ourselves and one another that whatever we're going through in this life, we are not going through it alone. It is in our being together, sharing together, listening and loving together, where the hope and possibility arises. May we always continue to live, act, and relate to one another from this place of hope and unimagined possibilities. Hope arouses as nothing else can arouse. A passion for the possible. Let us enter in a time of silence together to reflect on the hopes you are holding in your hearts. So, our first reading this morning is a responsive reading. You'll find it's responsive reading 519 in the back of your hymnal. This reading is by uh, Rabindranath Tagore. For those of you who don't know much about him, he is a uh, deeply rooted in both Indian and Western cultures, traditions. He's originally written in Bengali, uh, but later reached a broader audience in the West by recasting his poetry into English. Tagore won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913. Your part is the italis part. Let me not pray to be sheltered from dangers. Let me not beg for the stilling of my pain. Let me not look for allies in life's battlefield. Let me not crave an anxious fear to be saved. Grant me that grant me that I may not be a coward, feeling your mercy in my success alone. May it be so. <clears throat> right. <laughs> Our second reading is entitled, Open Eyes, by the Reverend Victoria Safford. It says Victorian in the order of service, it's actually Victoria. She writes, to see simply to look around and see is an ethical act, an intentional choice. To see with open eyes is a spiritual practice and thus a risk. For it can open you up to ways of knowing the world and loving it that will lead you to inevitable consequences. The awakened eye is a conscious eye, a willful eye, and brave. Because to see things as they are, each in its own truth, will make you very, very vulnerable. Think of yourself as a prism made of glass, reflecting everything exactly as it is, unable to exist dishonestly, reflecting beauty where there is beauty, violence where there is violence, loveliness and unexpected joy where there is joy, volition where there is volition. Here's the front page of the paper. Here's that seedy gossip conflict at your job. Here's a memory unblurred by wishful thinking. Here's a perfect afternoon in spring, and now buds. Buds are on the trees and blackbirds in the marsh. Here's the world, just as it is. Now look. That kind of seeing is a choice. 
and it's a sacred practice. And then there is a refraction. Taking into oneself as a prism takes in light the truth of what you see and hear and transforming it somehow, changing its direction, acting on it, rendering it somehow new. That again is holy work. Received comes out again as gratitude, dispersed into a spectrum, a sorrow, Yours or someone else's, fully realized and received, not denied, not covered up, not justified or explained away, ignored. Some sorrow clearly, previously seen, is taken in, it's absorbed and felt, and it reemerges, bent now into compassion. To see clearly is an act of will and conscious. It will make you very vulnerable. It is persistent, holy, world-transforming work. Here ends today's readings. Everybody recognize that tune? Yes. Some heads, some no. What's the name of it? A cockeyed optimist. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it was my request. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> and so we begin our service today with a story. And of course, a story is a story. So, it seems there were once two identical twins. They were alike in every way but one. One was a hope-filled optimist who only ever saw the brightest side of life. The other was a dark pessimist who only ever saw the downside in every situation. The parents were so worried about the extremes of optimism and pessimism in their boys that they took him to see a doctor. He suggested a plan. On the next birthday, Give the pessimist a shiny new bike, but give the optimist only a pile of manure. It seemed a fairly extreme thing to do. After all, the parents had always treated their boys equally, but in this instance, they started, they decided to try to the doctor's orders. So when the twins' birthdays came around, they gave the pessimist the most expensive, top-of-the-range racing bike a child could ever own. When he saw the bike, his first words were, I'll probably crash and break my leg. <laughs> to the optimist, they gave a carefully wrapped box of manure. He opened it, looked around for a moment, a little puzzled, and then ran out screaming, you can't fool me, with this much manure there has to be a pony here somewhere. <laughs> <clears throat> so there you have it, story is story. Henry Ford once said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. I think the same applies to the belief in the future success of our country. If you think we can, or if you think we can't, you're probably right. It depends on whether you are a pessimist or an optimist. Or let's make it more local. Does the future success of this congregation depend on our optimism or pessimism and how we view things? It comes down to the glass metaphor. Is the glass half empty or is it half full. For myself, I have always been a half full kind of guy. 
I look at life with some kind of curiosity, as it is as a wonderful adventure, with each chapter revealing new possibilities. I go about all of this with the mindset of the eternal optimist. Things will work out. And guess what? Sometimes they actually do. I think back to the few experiences in my life that reinforced this way of thinking. The first was following my bypass heart surgery in 2007. I had a quintuple bypass and there were lots of complications. They collapsed, the bypass graphs collapsed, and blah, blah, blah. And I left my position as the senior minister at First Parish in Lexington, moving back here to Provincetown, and going out on long-term disability. It all came together. That is, until I received a phone message, a phone message, mind you, from the disability insurance company telling me they were stopping my payments immediately as according to their doctors, I no longer qualified for disability. This was their final decision, they said. Of course, I could challenge it with a lawyer. This was about nine months into my collecting disability. I did hire a lawyer, but all the payments had stopped. In my mind, in my heart, I was viewing the situation with what Safford called the awakened eye, the conscious eye, a willful eye, and brave, because as these see things as they are, each in its own truth will make you very vulnerable. Believe me, I was very vulnerable during those times, but felt I had truth and honesty on my side. Friends and family and colleagues repeatedly would encourage me to think of a plan B. You know, just in case things don't work out. What are you going to do, they would ask. How will you afford to stay here? You have to think of other options. Yet being the cockeyed optimist, I just kept saying, it will all work out. I'm in the right and they, and they are experts are wrong. It was January of 2009. Nine months later, nine months later, my lawyer called me on Labor Day weekend to say they were reinstating my disability claim and a retroactive check would be issued to me ASAP. And going back to, my, to the local bank to deposit the check, the clerk at the bank, also a member of this meeting house and a friend, looked up at me and said, wow, Bill, this came right on time. You were down to your last dollar. I believe my optimistic view in this situation got me through those nine months. Had I had a more pessimistic outlook, the stress and worry would have landed me back in the hospital. I did call the insurance company to tell them uh, next time they need to talk to a cardiac patient, don't leave a message on the cell phone or on the phone machine when you cut off your entire financial support. I'm not quite sure if they got that yet. I feel optimism provides us with a sense of control and confidence over one's circumstances and what life throws at us at times. Optimists see opportunities in life where pessimists oftentimes only see problems. As Winston Churchill once stated, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. There's another story that demonstrates this really beautifully. It takes place in Thailand. The story is of a traveler who is walking down from a village in the mountains to a village in the valley. As he walked along, he saw a monk working in a field. As he stopped and said to the monk, I'm on my way to the village in the valley. Can you tell me what it's like there? The monk looked up from his labor and asked the man where he had come from. The man responded, I, I came from the village in the mountains. Well, what was that like? The monk asked. Oh, it was terrible, the man explained. No one spoke my language. I had to sleep on a dirt floor in one of their houses, and they fed me some sort of stew that had yak or dog or both in it, and the weather was atrocious. 
then I think you'll find the village in the valley is much the same, the monk said. A few hours later, another traveler passed by and he said to the monk, I'm on my way to the village in the valley. Can you tell me what it's like? Well, where have you come from? inquired the monk. I've come from the village in the mountains. And what was that like? Oh, it was awesome, the man replied. No one spoke my language, so we had to communicate using our hands and facial expressions. I had to sleep on the dirt floor, which was really cool, as I've never done that before. They fed me some sort of weird stew, and I have no idea what was in it, but just to experience how the locals lived was great, and the weather was freezing cold, which meant that I really got a taste of the local conditions. It was one of the best experiences of my life. The monk responded, Then I'll think you'll find the village in the valley is much the same. Life is 10% what happens to us and 90% of how we respond. Don't allow the challenges in your life to take away your joy. There are lots of reasons to complain and be miserable if that's how you look at life. There are lots of reasons to be enthusiastic and joyful if that's how you look at life. As Tagore reminds us, let me not pray to be sheltered from dangers, but to be fearless in facing them. So how do you look at your life? Certainly these are not earth-shattering examples that I spoke of, but rather simple ones that help shape one's experience. And I've always wondered, where do such attitudes come from? Are we human beings born with either an optimist or pessimistic strain of DNA? Do we learn from our parents or teachers or ministers? Or do they develop organically and naturally over time from our life experiences? I think it could be a combination of both. My mother, God bless her, was an internal optimist. And my father was a tad bit pessimistic. Uh, after I was going to college and I had to audition uh, to be accepted into Emerson's College Drama Department, I was going to be a famous actor. And being rejected by Emerson College <laughs> Drama Department, my mother's comment was, Oh, don't worry, Willem. She used to call me Willem. They told Cary Grant he couldn't act. My father said, Well, Buster, I guess you better find a new career. <laughs> so what about you? Do you have a more optimistic or pessimistic view of life and the world? Is your glass half empty? Or is it half full? Do you feel one attitude is more helpful than the other? As you look into your own lives, experiences, which frame of mind, optimism or pessimism, best help you through these experiences? Unitarian Universalist Minister Bruce Marshall wrote, optimism is an attitude of expectation that a particular result will occur, that a person will recover from an illness that the publisher's clearinghouse will pick my number. Marshall believes optimism often leads to disappointment when the best possible outcome does not occur. I'm not so sure I agree with him. My optimism is not about any expectation. It is about moving forward with the hope of what can be. Although Marshall concludes that it is hope and not optimism that will give us the most benefit. Yet in my research for this sermon today, it was discovered researchers found that optimists indeed produce a better life. But it is a shorter life. A shorter life. Yes, according to a recent study, the findings revealed that being overly optimistic in predicting a better future was associated with a greater risk of disability and death within the following decade. I'm going to die soon, I think. <laughs> Pessimism 
about the future may encourage people to live more carefully, taking health and safety precautions. I believe there is a takeaway point here. According to this research, realistic expectations help us to make smarter choices, and general optimism is very good for the mind and the body. To go along with the obvious benefits of an optimist mindset, it makes sense to be optimistic about your future, but not let it be blind optimism. Neither blind optimism or blind pessimism are good for you. Now listen to this. Author William Arthur Ward says, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The realist adjust the sails. So let's be realistic optimist. Adjust our sails as needed. Do our due diligence as necessary and move forward together with the mindset we can do whatever is possible if we put our collective minds, energy, and resources together. Because it is going to take all of us together be it for the future of this beloved congregation or the future of this beloved country. The one thing I am certain about is that it is all up to us, be it for our congregation or be it for our country. We as human beings can only save ourselves. We make God visible in this world. It reminds of a story of a young woman deep in prayer, extremely frustrated and downtrodden for all she is seeing around her and in the world. And in a quiet despair, she cries out, God, why don't you do something? In the silence that follows, she hears a voice. I did do something. I created you. My friends, whether you are an optimist, pessimist, or a realist, whether you walk around with your head in the clouds full of hopefulness or your head buried in the sand hiding out from your pessimists. Looking at every opportunity with open eyes is a sacred task. And know this, we create the unimagined possibilities for ourselves. The mind, the mind, the mind, wrote the Buddha. And Edison added, good fortune is what happens when opportunity meets with really good planning. When we go forth from this day, carefully planning our future and our fortune. Amen. And blessed be.